Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. She was a bright woman, headed down a dark path. She kind of started sowing her wild oats and living the wildlife. She was like out there and very carefree. She got in with the wrong crowd, started using drugs. But when she finally found true love, she transformed into a brand new woman. She just settled down. He was a very positive influence on her. For the first time in years, she has goals and ambition. But her new beginning would come to a horrific end. She was murdered. Her body was burned. It was the stuff that nightmares are made of. The investigation will uncover a tangled web of secrets. She was going to tell his wife. I knew nothing about the guy, never even heard of him. We're on a suspect number four, by my count. But which one is her killer? It was a big shock to me. He didn't seem like he fit the bill. I still can't believe that it's him. October 8th, 2014. It's a beautiful autumn morning in Gwinnett County, Georgia, a sprawling suburb northeast of Atlanta. Gwinnett County is a big place. It's got about a million people here. However, it has a really small town feel to it. We have a good school system. We have a good park system. The people are very nice. It's very small townish in that way. Good morning. Good morning. But one family's carefree stroll in the park is about to end in horror. Walking their dog early in the morning in the park. Oh my God, stop, what is that? They come across a dead body. The body is burned. They can see drag marks on the ground. Stunned, please, please, they please, rush please. back to the officer still parked near the green belt. They immediately went back and got the officers and told them, hey, there's a body over here. Right away, the police officers know that there's foul play involved. 6-5 to dispatch. Go ahead and start major problem. Star location. On the scene, homicide detectives start by trying to determine who the victim is. The bronze were pretty significant, but you could still tell that she was African-American. The victim doesn't have any ID on her, and there's nothing that readily identifies her. Despite that, detectives are able to determine the dead woman's identity. They brought a handheld unit they used to check fingerprints. Detective. Thank you. They were able to very quickly get a match. The victim is 26-year-old Lauren Taylor. Dalton, Georgia native Lauren Taylor had always been a fighter. Lauren was the tough girl. You know, she ain't take no crap off of nobody. She didn't have any kind of filter. She spoke her mind, told people what she thought. She was just fearless and fierce, and I just loved that energy. She always wanted to do her own thing. But despite her feisty exterior, Lauren also had a heart of gold. She just always had, like, a nurturing personality. She always just wanted to take care of people. She was a person that you could open up to. You could say the thing around her, and she can make you feel comfortable about yourself, make you feel loved. If you need her, she's going to be there. But Lauren was closest to her grandmother. Her grandmother was the matriarch in the family and really held everyone closely together. I was their mother, and that was their grandmother, but they looked at her like a mother, too. We would all always go to her house. We would all stay at her house. We were all close to her. However, during Lauren's junior year of high school, 
her beloved grandmother passed away and her life took a drastic turn. Lauren took it really hard when my mom passed. She was just kind of rebellious. It put her in a really bad place. She started doing things that was not her. She was going out to clubs and partying. She got into some trouble and getting into drugs and things like that. She was just searching for answers that she couldn't get. Lauren's search only led to more problems. She got in trouble with the police. She was getting locked up for different things, so it was just getting worse and worse. Lauren spent the next few years drifting, eventually ending up just across the state line in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She didn't have a job, she didn't have any money, so she was trying to do whatever she could to get money. She was a young lady that was just in a very precarious situation. Eventually, Lauren started working as an escort. She got into that lifestyle from the crowd that she became friends with, a bunch of females in Chattanooga that were doing that. And she clicked right in with them, because that's Lauren. She clicks in anywhere. She already was a beautiful girl, so she already got the attention. But it was like, hey, I, I can make money out of this. Lauren completely owned it. She owned it all the way. She didn't care how people viewed her or what they thought at this point anymore. She thought she was living the glamorous life. Lauren kept her source of income secret from her family back in Dalton, but they suspected something was going on. I knew she was making it day to day. I knew she had money to do certain things, but I never really tried to ask her, what are you doing? I didn't ask her, are you selling drugs? What are you doing to get this money? I would talk to her, tell her, come back home. You don't like to see your kids out there like that. But she seemed like she was living the life that she wanted to. However, just when it looked like Lauren's family had lost her, she met 36-year-old Jerry Day in the fall of 2013. Do you mind if I take a seat? Oh, no, not at all. He worked as a cable installer for a local company. He already had his own house. So you just got it going on. Yeah, I do pretty well. He seemed like a very good guy. Their chance encounter quickly turned into a relationship. It was a positive influence on her. He kind of settled her down. She moved in with him. She was just so in love. She always talked about how nice he was. She wanted to be with him to commit with him. In a stable situation for the first time in years, Lauren started getting her life back on track. Jerry was a big turnaround for her. She was trying to get in school for culinary arts. She was trying to get her GED. She's really moving towards the future. But Lauren's bright future is cut short when police discover her badly burned body in a suburban Atlanta park. They must have wondered if her troubled past had come back to haunt her. Or had Lauren's fresh start taken a deadly turn? They had a tumultuous relationship. It started getting a little aggressive. He could have motive to kill. Oh, what? Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. <laughs> By 2014, it appeared that 26-year-old Lauren Taylor was turning her life around thanks to boyfriend Jerry Day. Once she was with him, she was kind of a different person. She wasn't as wild. She was trying to change and become a better person and do better with her life. It was like she's finally getting it together. I'm not going to have to worry about somebody calling me saying something happened. But now, more than a year after meeting Jerry and getting her life back on track, 
Detectives have just found Lauren's dead body dumped in a suburban Atlanta park. There were drag marks on the ground, which imply that she was likely killed somewhere else and then brought to this spot. She didn't have to be doing something here locally. She could have been killed where she was from and then just dropped off in that county. Then whoever dumped the body had set it on fire. They was burning using accelerant, probably gasoline, most likely. For lack of better terms, it was horrific. How Lauren's body ended up in the park isn't entirely clear to detectives. Obviously, it was a homicide, but I don't think they had any idea in what direction to go or where to turn. Once they found the identity of the victims, Taylor, they had no leads and they had to start from scratch. Lauren's body offers few clues about her killer's identity. She was wrapped up in a blanket and set on fire. The only part of that blanket that was really there still was a part that was directly underneath her body. Crime scene investigators also gather the trash and debris surrounding the body in faint hopes that something might trace back to Lauren's killer. There were cigarette butts everywhere. It was an open public park. So anything that they thought that could be helpful in the investigation and took into evidence, I would say it was probably over 100 pieces of stuff they just took just there on the scene. While the CSI team works, detectives head to Dalton, Georgia, to inform Lauren's mother of her daughter's murder. Unfortunately, that's one of the jobs that falls to detectives. And they drove up and they let her know that Lauren had been killed. They told me, we found your daughter in a park this morning. And after that, I don't think I heard anything for about at least about 10 minutes. I was just in shock. She had so much more to do in life. She just didn't deserve it at all. When detectives ask Lauren's mother if she has any idea who might want to hurt her daughter, she tells them no. There really wasn't too much I could tell them. You know, I mean, all I knew is she was staying in Chattanooga. However, Lauren's mother thinks there's someone who can help. Her sister, Michelle, they were very close. Lauren confided in her about a lot of stuff that she didn't tell other people. Lauren's mother calls Michelle, who comes straight over. Thank you for meeting with us. Michelle says she has no idea why her sister would be anywhere near Gwinnett County, where police had found her body. She did not typically come here. She didn't know anybody down there. Although Michelle does explain that her sister has a troubled past. She was very forthcoming about it. Lauren had some struggles. She got in with the wrong crowd, started using drugs, and turned to sex work. That's how she supported herself. How did your sister um, find her clients? Mostly through Backpage. At the time, Backpage was one of the most popular sources for those kind of endeavors. And she did have regular customers that she would see. According to Michelle, that changed when Lauren started dating Jerry Day. They had a good relationship in the beginning. I was happy that she found somebody who seemed to genuinely care about her. However, after several months of dating, Michelle says things started to change. All of a sudden now, her relationship with her boyfriend, it wasn't going so good. It went from good to bad in a hot second. Lauren had told her sister that Jerry had been violent in the past. Did you ever witness any of the violence? No. I just heard about it from Lauren. The sister said that her boyfriend broke some of her fingers. Michelle says that despite Jerry's behavior, Lauren had stayed with him until the night of October 3rd, just five days before police found her body. Lauren called Michelle that night and told her that something had happened between her and Jerry, but she didn't go into detail as to what that something was. She just told her that Jerry had kicked her out of the house. Michelle didn't learn what happened until later that night when she gave her sister a ride to a friend's house. She was going to go stay with some friends in Rising Fawn, Georgia, who she had met a few months back. No, no, wait, she was real hysterical. She was just crying as bawling. According to what Michelle tells detectives, Lauren may have had reason to be upset. Lauren had told the boyfriend that she was pregnant. 
and he didn't like that. He just flipped out. He didn't want to have a baby. He told her to get out. But now that Lauren is dead, detectives wonder if that's all Jerry had done. Lauren's pregnancy may have been motivation for him. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Time to kill. Detectives investigating the murder of 26-year-old Lauren Taylor have just learned a disturbing piece of news about Lauren and her boyfriend. They had had a major breakup right before all of this happened. She had told him she was pregnant and he had flipped out. I don't think my sister was really pregnant. Do you think Jerry knew that? I doubt it. Lauren's sister told the police that Jerry had kicked her out of the house after an argument. Detectives wonder if that's all Jerry had done. She told me he's crazy and, and something's wrong, like he's delusional. So that was my first thoughts, like, this guy must be involved. Michelle tells detectives that Lauren had spent the night of October 3rd with her. So what did she do after she left her exes? She stayed with me that night. And then she had me take her to a friend's house the next day. According to Lauren's sister, the friend lives in Rising Fawn, Georgia, a small town just across the Tennessee state line from Chattanooga. Michelle said that Lauren was hoping to stay with a friend for a few days until she could figure out what she could do. Because Ms. Taylor didn't work a regular job, she was living off of her boyfriend, for lack of better terms. Do you think she could have gone back into prostitution? Her sister's answer stuns detectives. She told them that Lauren had continued to work as a prostitute this entire time. Lauren, on more than one occasion, to go out and turn tricks. Do you think Jerry was aware of her work as an escort? I really don't know. If he knew, that may have given him further motive. Although, according to Michelle, Jerry had another reason to be angry with Lauren. Lauren had taken a bunch of the boyfriend's things, uh, like a PlayStation 3, a Fire tablet, some very expensive guitars. She felt like she was owed those things for being in the house with him, and she was looking for a way to get money. After talking to Lauren's sister, detectives have a few possible suspects. But so far, Jerry Day has the most motive. At that point, he's probably prime suspect number one. However, since Lauren had continued working as an escort, Jerry's far from the only suspect. It's possible that her killer could have been a client. When detectives receive Lauren's autopsy report, it does provide some clear answers about how she died. She had died by asphyxiation first, meaning somebody had choked her to death and then set on fire. There was no soot in her lungs or her trachea. However, the report's findings also raise questions about her breakup with Jerry. There was no evidence that Lauren had broken any fingers recently. And furthermore, she wasn't even pregnant. Hoping for some answers, detectives reach out to 36-year-old Jerry Day. They're unable to get a hold of him, so detectives left a message asking him if he could call them back. Then, while waiting to hear back from Jerry, detectives drive up to Rising Fawn and knock on the door of the home where Michelle dropped off her sister. That was the last time that the sister heard from or talked to Lauren. Hi, we're with the Gwinnett County Police Department. Are your parents home? No. Do you know when they might be back? No, I don't know. The girl does know Lauren, though. Lauren was staying with them. She's been here for the last couple of days. However, the girl says that when she came home from school yesterday afternoon, 
Lauren wasn't there. When she asked her father where Lauren was, he said that she was gone and she wasn't going to be coming back. This sent off red flags for the police. Before detectives can get any further, a car pulls up to the house. Hey, what's going on here? Gwinnett County Police. We're conducting an investigation. What's your name, sir? Leo Kendrick. Honey, you can go inside. It's OK. Oh, is that your daughter? Yes. What's this about? We understand that there's a woman by the name of Lauren Taylor who's been staying here with you. Uh-huh. So his statement is that Lauren did come to stay with him, but when the police got there, she had already left. But his answer isn't what makes detectives suspicious. His clothes actually smelled like gasoline. He had scratches on his hands that were consistent with defensive marks. They thought they may very well have their killer in front of them. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. Detectives investigating the murder of Lauren Taylor believe they may have just uncovered her killer, Leo Kendrick, the man she'd been staying with after breaking up with her boyfriend. He had scratch marks on his hands that were consistent with somebody trying to fend off somebody choking them, and he had gasoline on his clothing. They knew that some sort of flamant had been placed on Lauren's body prior to burning her. Detectives don't think it's a coincidence. Sir, why do you have scratch marks? He said that he was a brick mason and that those are consistent with scratches he might receive laying brick. He said that gasoline was part of his work as well. However, his answers seem all too convenient for detectives. OK, so why was she living here? Leo said that Lauren had been watching their daughter while his wife was out of town. She was helping out with the kids while my wife went out of town. Leo tells detectives that Lauren had left yesterday without much explanation. But Lauren left. Why? She was talking to this guy on the phone, saying she needed money and stuff for him to come pick her up. Did you catch his name? Something about Charmaine. So no, no last name or anything? No, sir. Eventually, around 2 o'clock on the 7th, a person in a black truck did show up. Well, did you get a look at him? No, sir, he never got out the car. Did Lauren say where he was taking her? No, sir. Did she say when she might be coming back? No, sir, I didn't think she was. He said she took her stuff with her when she left. Is Leo telling the truth? So they decided to search his home because they knew that at some point Lauren had been there. During the search, detectives discover evidence that suggests Leo isn't telling them the whole story. When officers served a search warrant on the home, they found some of the items Lauren had stolen from her ex-boyfriend, including guitars, that PlayStation. Which contradicted Leo's claim that Lauren had taken all of her stuff when she had left. Mr. Kensick, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to take you in. What about my daughter? We'll allow you to make arrangements for her before we go in. Investigators know that he's lied to them, so they bring him in for an interview. At the station, Leo denies he had anything to do with Lauren's death. I wouldn't hurt her. I swear. It's Charmaine, guys, who you need to talk to. He does admit to lying about Jerry's guitars and PlayStation, however. He thought that he would get in trouble for having stolen property in his home. The rest of Leo's story appears to check out, too. Turns out that Masons regularly had that kind of damage to their hands, and they have gasoline on their clothing. So his story was confirmed. But while Leo insisted that detectives should have been looking into this mysterious Charmaine character, the name was all he could really give them. Listen, anything you can tell us about him would be helpful. I really don't know that much. 
he knew Lauren and him had some kind of relationship, that he was the kind of guy who had money and that she would typically use him when she needed money. We're gonna let you go, but if you remember anything, let us know. Once detectives release Leo, they turn their attention to tracking down Charmaine. At this point, now we know that Charmaine was actually the person who picked Lauren up from the home in Rising Fawn, making him the last person that has seen her alive. But who is he? Detectives hope Lauren's mother can fill them in. I only knew one Charmaine in Dalton. And I said, there's no way you're talking about Charmaine going. Charmaine works for an organization called Launch, where he mentors ex-cons to try to help them get their lives back on track. Charmaine was a guy who went to prison as a young person for an armed robbery, but from all intents and purposes, he had gotten his life together when he got out. He was working with the Chattanooga Police Department, people that are in gangs and stuff, trying to get them established when they get out of prison. He was married. He was a deacon in his church. He had children. When detectives bring Charmaine in for questioning, he tells them that he did give Lauren a ride the day before police found her dead body. This is what happened. So the girl, she called me. She, I mean, she uh, Facebooked me, asked me to meet with her. I did. He said that they haven't known each other for a very long time. He says that he had helped Lauren when she was homeless. He says they met one day, and he looked down a side street and saw a girl sitting next to a dumpster. Here is this young girl. She needed a place to sleep, to stay. Him being the upstanding pillar of community that he was, he got her a hotel room that night. Then Charmaine says he turned to the nonprofit he worked with and helped Lauren get back on her feet. He's a Christian, and that's what Christians do. They help people in need. It's during that time that Lauren met Jerry, and she seemed to be getting her life back on track. But all the while, Lauren had remained in regular contact with Charmaine. She would call and text Mr. Goins for assistance. So Charmaine says it wasn't all that surprising when she called, asking for a ride at around noon on October 7th. Uh, she just wanted to uh, get, get out, get away from her house and call OK? And uh, she said something about that. Somebody had, they had got the R again. She just wanted to get away from here. I had told her, you know, what are you doing? What's going on with you and Jerry? Oh, I had to get away. So then after that, I went down and picked up. Then where'd you go from there? We drove back to uh, Chattanooga. OK. Yep, and then uh, uh, that's when I dropped off. That was the end of his involvement. He said that she had friends come to pick her up from the Eastgate Mall. She was texting some guy known as Fat Boy. He thought it was her drug dealer, her marijuana dealer. Although according to Charmaine, Fat Boy wasn't waiting when he dropped Lauren off at the mall. Well, thank you for the ride. Hey, no problem. It's all right. Just be safe out there. That was the last time that he had heard from or talked to Lauren. But then, just as the interview appears to be over, Charmaine says something that changes everything. Anything else that you've thought of that, that maybe you didn't tell me? Yeah, I really can't talk to my wife about the situation of this young lady. Charmaine admits to the police that he and Lauren were having an affair. It was a Lifetime movie coming real life. We had sex that weekend. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. <laughs> Barely 48 hours after police found Lauren Taylor's body in a suburban Atlanta park, 
Her friend Charmaine Goins has just dropped a bombshell. Mr. Goins did have an extramarital affair with Ms. Taylor. That was while Charmaine was working with his nonprofit to help Lauren find a place to live. However, Charmaine swore he would never do anything to hurt Lauren. I was good to Lauren. I wouldn't hurt him. Asked where he was in the hours after he dropped Lauren at the mall, Charmaine says he'd been helping a friend named Sammy Betts. He had an alibi for that night because he was in bed at home with his wife when his friend called and said he needed a jump start. I think 1115, 1120, somewhere around there. He had gone to help him with the car. This is what kind of person Mr. Goins is. Charmaine says that his wife could vouch for him getting up out of bed that night and that his friend could vouch for him. Detectives conclude their interview with Charmaine and let him go. When they follow up with his wife, she confirms Charmaine's story. What she said was that he got up out of bed and went to jumpstart that friend. She also says that Charmaine told her about his affair with Lauren. She was devastated, as he knew she would be. Um, I think that he admitted it because he knew that it was going to be hard for him to keep a secret, so he went ahead and told her before she heard about it secondhand. Will Charmaine's friend Sammy also confirm his account? Before detectives can find out, they finally hear back from Lauren's ex, Jerry Day. I was like, he said that he had been out of town for a while. After he and Lauren broke up, he decided to go out with his friends on a camping trip to get over it all. He says that he didn't even know the police were looking for him until he came back from out of the mountains. When he speaks with detectives later that day, Jerry still appears distraught about Lauren's murder. He says he still very much had love for Lauren. When she first moved in with him, he thought that he might have found the one. But you broke up with her, so there must have been problems. Yeah, I started to see a different side of him. She could be really aggressive, you know? He said she would often put hands on him. She was actually destructive in his house. He talked about how she broke things. She actually frightened him. But it was what I heard last, right before we broke up. That, that really was the last straw for me. He found out that she had been having sex with somebody else, paid sex. I confronted her, and it was obvious. So I, I broke up with her after that. He immediately broke it off with her. But she wasn't going to have that happen. She said I couldn't break up with her because she was having my baby. An unwanted pregnancy is a motive for murder. So you don't understand. Lauren wasn't pregnant. It was a regular thing that she would say when they got into fights. Police are inclined to believe Jerry's story especially since they confirmed that Lauren wasn't pregnant. So what did you say to her? I told her she was lying. He was trying to break up with Lauren. So if she was pregnant, he was asking that she have an abortion. After that, I told her to leave, but she refused. He then left the house, and he called the police to come have her removed. And when I came back with the cops, Lauren was gone, and so were a bunch of my things. After that, I made sure Lauren would never contact me again. Jerry's statement lined up with what detectives had previously heard from Lauren's sister and Lauren's friend, Leo. When detectives follow up with Jerry's friends, they confirm his alibi. There were multiple people that could vouch for his location and whereabouts. So he went from day one suspect number one to being out of the equation as somebody who we know did not commit this murder. With Jerry ruled out as a suspect, detectives move on to the other person who could verify Charmaine Goins' alibi. His friend, Sammy Betts. He was an ex-felon. He had spent time in custody. When he got out, Mr. Goins helped him get a job. But there's something else about Sammy that really catches the detective's attention. When the police look up Sammy's prior address, they notice that it was right across the park from where Lauren's body was found. Now we're on a suspect number four, by my count. With their eye on Sammy, investigators call him on the grounds of going over Charmaine's alibi. That's who they thought had something to do with her death. So do you know Lauren Taylor? Nah, I knew we were sooner, though. 
Charmaine had told him about the affair with Lauren. But Sammy's portrayal of the relationship is different from Charmaine's. I knew he had got a little fed up with her. He wanted to end the affair, but didn't know what to do. He talked about how she was crazy and how she was going to tell his wife about what was happening. He just somehow needed to get rid of Lauren. The friend said in response, that's not a good idea. Don't even think like that. You think Charmaine took that advice? Yeah, because after a while, he stopped talking about it. The detectives aren't so sure. But Sammy offers them what appears to be proof of Charmaine's alibi. There were a series of text messages asking for a jump start. After we got my car fixed, we went out to breakfast. What time did you get home? Like 6 AM. We see you used to live near the Sean Park. Yes, sir. My girlfriend lives over there. She still lived at that address, and he would go there on the weekend sometime. You do know that's where they found the body, Miss Taylor? I heard on the news. However, according to Sammy, that was just a coincidence. When detectives asked about his connection to where they found Lauren's body, Sammy shrugged it off. On the night of October 7th, were you anywhere near that park? No, sir. But is the ex-con telling the truth? Or was Charmaine's phone about to prove Sammy's undoing? If you're making a phone call, they can tell which tower was used to make that phone call or send that text. They called me with information. It was just like my mouth dropped open. We knew we had the right guy. Welcome back to Dealing Together. First caller? I bought three sweaters to get the fourth free. Oh, you got fleeced. Next caller? I traded my old Samsung at AT&T for a new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus and chose my plan. That's not a bad deal. It is not. Our best smartphone deals. Your choice of plan. Learn how to get the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Plus with Galaxy AI on us with eligible trade-in. AT&T. Connecting changes everything. Offers vary by device. Subject to change. S24 plus 256 gigabyte offer available for a limited time. Terms and restrictions apply. See att.com slash Samsung for details. <laughs> When detectives question ex-con Sammy Betts about the night Lauren Taylor died, he appears to confirm Charmaine Goins' alibi. He says that Charmaine did, in fact, come jump his car. And they went and had some breakfast at IHOP. However, detectives suspect Sammy may be hiding something. According to his parole records, he once lived near where the police found Lauren's body. Still unsure of Charmaine's alibi, Detectives keep digging. We started to get phone records, starting with Lauren's. Lauren's records reveal that her relationship with Charmaine was anything but casual. They text all the time. They used affectionate names for each other, say, I love you all the time. He was telling Lauren he was going to leave his wife. But by the time Lauren had broken things off with Jerry, it was clear that something with Charmaine had changed. She had texted Charmaine asking for money. She had just been kicked out of her house. She needed somewhere to stay. Charmaine blew her off. There were so many text messages, and he didn't respond back. Left in the lurch with no money and nowhere to go, Lauren panicked. She's texting him saying, hey, if you don't pick up your phone, I'm going to show up at your kids' schools. I'm going to show up at your wife's house. I'm going to tell them all about us. That got Charmaine's attention. He responds. There were very angry, upset text messages, but Charmaine agrees to go and pick her up from Rising Fawn. At 2 p.m. on the afternoon of the 7th, Charmaine sent Lauren a text to say he was outside. Lauren's phone was never used after that. When detectives received Charmaine's phone records, their contents are even more damning. After getting his phone records and having them mapped out that he had not, in fact, gone to help his friend jumpstart his car, we have him pinging around the 285 east towards Gwinnett County. The signal basically led right to where police found Lauren's body. We knew we had our person. They arrest him and charge him with Lauren's murder. He was indicted on malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault. I was happy that they arrested somebody, but 
I still can't believe that it's him that did this. He's trying to help people. But when Charmaine goes on trial on August 29, 2017, the prosecutors move quickly to demolish the church deacon's good guy image. He was a man of two lives, a man who had a life that you, we all wanted on the surface. But in his second life, he was a person who used his position to get what he wanted from women and a manipulator. And eventually, and most importantly, he was a killer. Prosecutors believe that the beginning of Charmaine's story was essentially true. He actually does go and pick her up. From there, I believe that Charmaine did actually take her to the Eastgate Mall. When people start telling lies, they try to include a little bit of truth to make it more believable. But prosecutors believe Lauren never made it out of Charmaine's SUV. It seemed like the text conversation argument led to argument in person. She said something. She did something that he didn't like. Hey, I'm telling you, keep your mouth shut. I will tell your wife, your children, everybody's going to know about you. Ain't no Mr. Nice Guy. Hey, shut it up. She was going to out him. He would probably lose his wife. He would probably lose his job. He was scared. Lauren was tough, and she meant what she said. That's when and where he killed her. <laughs> Presented with the evidence detectives have against Charmaine, Sammy Betts agrees to testify for the prosecution. He says Charmaine didn't tell him what he was going to do or why he was doing it. He just told him that they were going to send a series of text messages asking for a jump start and that he was going to act like he came and jump started him. Then, with his cover story arranged, Charmaine had hit the road, driving Lauren's body as far from Chattanooga as he could. But I think it was the only part that he was familiar with in Gwinnett County. Once inside the park, Charmaine dragged Lauren's body down the trail and tried to set it on fire. But in doing so, he made another error. I guess bodies don't burn like you see on TV. They were able to take her fingerprints at the scene. They very quickly got a match. From there, everything left the detectives back to Charmaine. When it's the defense's turn, they suggest that Lauren's work as an escort led to her death. Because Lauren was still working as a prostitute, there could have been any number of men who may have become violent with her. In the end, it's not enough to sway the jury, who find Charmaine guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I was happy they made the right decision. We got some type of justice for her. I want him to sit in prison for the rest of his life and think about what he did. And while Charmaine broods in prison, Lauren's family will never forget the life he snuffed out far too soon. There's not one day that goes by that I don't think about her. She didn't deserve what happened to her. She had her whole life to live, literally.